I'd like to say good morning to everyone. Thank you for uh, joining Rumsey's continuing and ongoing locked in series here hosted by our Rumsey specialists. My name is Sean Huber. I'm one of the automation group managers here at Rumsey. Today we're continuing to focus on the power side of our business and uh, doing a presentation on the common dimensional fitment issues and around motors and some of the other things that, uh, that do come about with uh, replacement and or new applications. Uh, with that, I will. Uh, I would like to introduce Jeff Llewellyn. Uh, Jeff is one of Rumsey's power transmission specialists. He typically resides in our Conshohocken office when he's not locked in at home, and hopefully the uh, the lawnmower is away from him at this point. Um, Jeff has over 13 years of varied PT experience, and uh, kind of fills a, a host of roles within Rumsey. Uh, from supporting some of our, our site services to fixing gearboxes and even uh, helping design and implement some aluminum guarding uh, when appropriate. Um, but for the purposes of today, he's, uh, he's going to fall into one of his primary roles, which is a, uh, is a motor specialist and kind of go through some of the things that he sees on a daily basis uh, when people uh, give him a call. So with that, Jeff, I will turn it over to you. You are uh, clear to take over. All right. Thank you, Sean. Um, so right off the bat, Sean nailed it on the head. I got uh, 13 years in the power transmission industry. Um, started out a small company called Transmission Engineering, uh, specialized as a field service technician, uh, really chasing around a bunch of off-highway and marine gear issues. And then uh, once we went through the acquisition from, uh, from Rumsey, once they bought us out, I've been using those skills to try and uh, help out as much as I can with, uh, especially in areas like this, where using this facial recognition for being out in the field kind of really helps out with uh, finding issues with motors. So the agenda today, we're gonna go over, have kind of an overview of efficiencies and changes that happened uh, recently. Uh, nameplate information, you know, kind of what is and isn't there, mechanical considerations. We're going to touch on the electrical considerations since this is more mechanical based. And then we'll go over uh, an example at the end. So not all motors are created equal. Uh, prices and specifications wire vary wildly from manufacturer uh, to manufacturer, even within the same manufacturer. Motors can be big, heavy, and hard to install. Uh, if you have a spec sheet at least gets you an idea of what the, you're looking for for uh, fitment issues or weight of the of the motor going in or coming out and then uh, if the motor is uh, incorrectly spec'd it uh, doesn't match the application or the environment the lifespan of the motor is actually going to be decreased so the efficiencies that came out most most likely these two are going to be the most common calls recently of any kind of motor fitment issues. Um, they weren't meant to be that way, but it's kind of a side effect of, of trying to get increased efficiency out of a motor. Uh, there's only so many ways you can do it. And then you have the side effects of what happens with these two efficiency rules. Uh, first one is increased length. To get efficiency out of a motor, you got to put more windings in it or better insulation. Uh, so that happens. Sometimes you get an increased length of the motor. Sometimes the motors wind up having to be upsized, meaning that if it was in a smaller frame to begin with, but it was at the very cusp of that frame to, at the uh, beginning, but he did the changes to the winding and the other materials that had to go inside of it, manufacturers thought it'd be best to take that motor and up it into the next frame size. So then that changes your outside dimensions, um, your, your height and your width and your length sometimes. Or the biggest downside is the obsolete at the motor uh, based on sales or just couldn't meet the, regu the, the requirements of those regulations. So application considerations, uh, no matter what you do when you're going to talk to somebody about uh, a new motor or replacement motor for for uh, your existing machines, you really got to kind of fill them in. So kind of, you know, you got to look at knowing what the application is. If it's a fan, is it outside? Is it inside? Uh, 
pictures, the pictures really help convey those messages because there's going to be a lot of other questions that come up. Uh, you know, if you can't get pictures, at least have maybe some kind of documentation, uh, especially you know, about the room available. Uh, that seems to be a big one for me uh, on a daily basis is the motors just don't fit the same way. Uh, so space is a, is a concern, so pictures could help out with that. Uh, and the motor starting. A lot more people are going through, and once they're replacing the old motor, they're turning over and putting in a drive. So uh, the voltage considerations need to be um, thought about and kind of what your turndown needs are. So if you're going to be using it on a conveyor, maybe you don't need it to be a, a vector duty motor. Uh, here's a slide that I had used in a previous presentation that kind of goes over the differences between a new application and a replacement. They're kind of, some of the stuff is the same. Uh, biggest one for us is an emergency or spare. Uh, that really changes the way we approach it, um, even, even for the way you would approach it, because sometimes you kind of uh, get in that emergency situation. You don't think about all the other stuff that needs to be involved in it. You kind of just want to get up and run it. Uh, how the motor fail? Uh, the failure mode of the motor sometimes could be really helpful uh, to whoever's looking for a replacement. Maybe it just maybe didn't match the environment, uh, or you know, recently they put a drive on it and, they, and the old motor didn't have good enough insulation. So that's something to take into consideration. Uh, again, more pictures. That's <laughs> a, a good one because we don't know your application. Um, how it started, it's same thing. Is it a cross line inverter? Um, is it a vector duty? Uh, and then lastly, can it be rewound? Uh, that's, a, that's a tough one because sometimes if it's a motor that's typically 75 horsepower-ish and higher, they make a good candidate to be rewound. But um, there's a time uh, crunch on that. So if you need the motor up and ready, you might look into a replacement and then take the old one that was taken out and have that rewound. Uh, it's so it's usually larger size motors or if it's got a, a special housing that you can no longer find so that's how those work out um, nameplate information the nameplate tells you a lot um, so it gives you the frame size uh, you know so it gives you the NEMA frame size which is great because they're standard uh, enclosure kind of goes back over again gives you the environment gives you your horsepower your voltages, even gives you your speed that you're running at. Um, the speed's a, speed's a little different because there's different ones. There's there's multiple poles. So if you give a two-pole motor, that's going to spin at 3,600 RPM, whereas if you have a four-pole motor, it's going to be good at 900 RPM area. And what a way to think of it is if you have two poles, you can run a lot faster. You just don't have as much torque. You can't carry a heavier load. Whereas the adverse is if you have an eight pole motor, you got eight sets of legs that can carry a heavier load, but you just can't get the coordination to run fast enough. Um, it's kind of a way I kind of keep that in my mind when I'm thinking about those things. Um, and then insulation class. Again, since a lot of the motors are now becoming uh, starter and inverter rated, uh, they kind of, you want to be able to have a better insulation in there so you're not burning through it with a, running on a drive. So we're going to kind of break this presentation up from this point into mechanical considerations and electrical considerations because they aren't really the, the one and the same, and it kind of makes it flow a little bit easier for us to, to follow along. So here we have six motors. They're all 10 horsepower, 215 frame size. Voltage is pretty much the same, uh, but as you can tell, the housings are all different, so they meet different environmental issues, uh, requirements, uh, different materials. And then if you see, typically most motors are built to be horizontal, like five out of these six are, but then you get the vertical ones. That they're, they're there. You need to know that. And sometimes if you have a vertical application, it's you need to relay that message because sometimes we'll just go straight for a horizontal not realizing we're kind of getting the wrong thing. So frame sizes. Great thing, standards make it a lot easier for manufacturers of motors and people who have to deal with them on a daily basis because now we have a standard that they're going to build these motors to. Uh, so dimensionally, they should all line up as long as they meet the standard. If they do something that's non-standard, then the motor has to be tagged that way. Uh, 
So we're going to go over some of these. So the D dimension, D dimension is your center line of your shaft height. And that line, uh, that D dimension is pretty much your starting point for any time you're trying to change housings or compare motors, uh, especially if you have an older non-NEMA motor that has a really tall or really weird uh, shaft size. When you go and try and compare a new motor to that, uh, you got to kind of search around, find that's what's closest to the dimension of the, of the old motor without going over it. And that's where you start comparing the two motors. Uh, we'll go over that a little bit. I have an overlay that we prepared for this um, to show, to kind of show what that does. But if you have a different D dimension, you'll need to have um, a plate on the bottom, some kind of stand to get you to match up for your, for your mounting locations, which is in the next slide. So the E, the 2F, and the H are all dimensions that deal with the footing itself. Uh, if it's a C-face motor with no foot, these kind of don't play a role in it. But if they do have a foot on it, the E dimension from looking at the front of the motor is the width of the dimension. And then if you look at the F, which is the side of the motor, that is front to back measurement for those mounting locations. So again, if you have the same frame size, you should be able to bolt it right to the same spot. No issues. And the H is your bolt hole diameter. So that makes it, you know, again, same fasteners should all fit the same motor size. Now you move into the, the U, N, A, N, W, and A, H. They all have to deal with shaft sizes. Uh, the U is the shaft diameter. Uh, that makes a big difference if you're going into a gearbox uh, without having to put some kind of bushing on there. Uh, so those are things you got to be aware of. Uh, or if it's a belt application, you might have to change the shift if the U isn't the same. The NW and AH are kind of similar in the fact that they deal with the length of the shaft. Uh, again, the NW is for a T-frame and the, and the AH is for a C-face. Um, so those, they do have certain uh, characteristics that are different because of the mating phase. <clears throat> now we're going to get into the ones that aren't so uh, specific. These are given to the manufacturers as a leeway to make their motors what they want to make them. Um, so NEMA doesn't have uh, any specifications on these following dimensions, the A, B, the C, the O, and the P. They're all critical, though, to when you go and do your shaft and when you're doing your sizing. Again, the C dimension really puts you out there. Uh, is the most common one that really affects a lot of people is that it's just the motor has gotten so much longer it can't fit it into an application. So those are critical. Um, the AB is critical if you're moving a conduit box around or you don't have enough room. Some motors come without one. Um, so knowing that dimension is kind of important. Uh, not to mention in the next, in, the, in another slide, we'll go over and see why it's important, especially when it deals with wiring. Um, so the O and the P, they're to the height and the width of the motor. Uh, again, they're not a standard, so manufacturers can make a motor a little bit wider if they have to, a little bit taller, so they don't have to stick with those dimensions that are written down. Here we have a, a description or a picture of the O and P and how they vary uh, from the same frame size. Um, two different manufacturers, totally different materials. The gray picture or the gray motor is aluminum, uh, whereas the blue one is uh, cast iron. So you can see dimensionally they're totally different. But they're both 254 or 245 T frames. So that means they can actually bolt into one another's uh, respectively without any kind of issue. The C dimension, again, this is the same size motor same manufacturer, but they have different they have different tolerances. So this is their, their minimum and their maximum that could be in that frame size. So you may not think two inches is a lot, but when you get to something where the motor's kind of backed in there and it's kind of really shoot horn into a uh, into a, a machine application, you may not be able to get that 11 inch motor in there, almost 12 inch motor. It just it's just not going to fit. Now, your AB dimension, this is the one that uh, I was talking about. Not knowing where the location of this is, 
<clears throat> or verifying that you have enough cable to do this, uh, especially if it's it's if it's in a, a in a conduit that's hard uh, hard lined in there. You can't constantly you can't change it. So sometimes you just got to know what these are. So uh, another thing that's not caught out in the tags too is the F location of that conduit box. So you have F1, which is looking at the motor on the left hand side. F0 is directly on top, which is very common in IEC configurations. And F2 is on the right side. Again, not knowing this, you can accidentally order the wrong motor, and then you have to try and figure out how to do with your wiring. So here's, an over, here's the overlay that we used. Uh, we used the same motor, and we do this on time to time at Rumsey, uh, just so that we can, we can verify, one, for ourselves that we're getting a good fit, uh, two, is it's very easy for you to take a look and see that, hey, this condo box just isn't in the right location. Uh, is that going to be an issue? I mean, do you need to have it on to the F1 location? So these things make it easier. And if you look at it, the shafts are lined up. And again, that's how you start out doing these overlays. You take the motor, put them together at that D dimension, and then you start off from there. And then you can start making all your uh, measurements to make sure everything matches. <clears throat> Having an overlay though like this saves a lot of time. So I haven't really touched on the IEC frame configuration uh, just because they're they're not so popular here. But they're becoming more popular because of machines coming over from Europe. Uh, different standards but for mechanical sizing they pretty much almost follow the same thing as NEMA. If you look down on the lower left-hand side, you'll see the mounting locations of A, B, C, H, A, B, and K. Um, they're pretty much the standards as NEMA. Those are the ones where they're building the motor to that specification. So you could take another motor frame that's a 100, a 100 millimeter frame, and you can grab another manufacturer that has another 100 millimeter frame, and it should bolt in that same spot. Pretty much the same as NEMA. Mounting styles. So we're going to go from left to right. The NEMA T or IEC B3, that's more of your inline application that's coupled or belted. Um, very common, both IEC and, and NEMA. Um, the C face or B14 is much more prevalent here in the States. Um, it's usually used when you have a PT component that's being driven by. It's directly coupled to it. The difference is uh, the arrow, if you see the hardware, goes from the, from the PT component into the motor. Um, and that's how we do it here. But in Europe, the IEC B5 flange or D flange for NEMA is very prevalent. Um, on a lot of equipment that comes here. Um, it's kind of following like a servo style uh, adapter. So the bolts actually come through the face of the motor and bolt into the power driven component. So those are the three most popular styles for induction motors. Here we have a mechanical integral gearbox um, or gear motor. They're becoming more prevalent as well. Uh, the biggest thing with them is that the, the pinion that drives that gearbox is actually part of that motor. They're, they're, it's all one and the same. So if you take that off, take that motor off, the pinion's gonna come out and you're not gonna be able to turn the gearbox. So it's all one piece. Um, now we have capabilities to different manufacturers we have. We can actually convert them over or just not convert it, but convert it to a different manufacturer to get a C-face on there. Then you could just pop the motor off the shelf, put it on there. Um, so they're becoming more prevalent. Just want to bring it up to, to show that they're what to look for in that. Now your mechanical enclosures, um, again, this goes back to matching the application to the environment um, and, the, and the frame to it. Uh, you wouldn't want to take an open drip proof motor that's going to be in an area where somebody's hosing stuff off all day long. Uh, the motor's not really meant for that. It's kind of it's more of a dry in, inside environment. It has plenty of air to be able to flow up and over. It's not too dusty. Um, whereas you get into the other motors, they're all enclosed. Um, 
the stainless steel motor in the middle. It's definitely going to be better for your wash down environment where somebody's hosing stuff off. Uh, the totally enclosed air over, um, that's more or less a fan is going to be bolted to that. That's going to be in the airstream. The airstream that this is the, that's being driven by this motor is what's cooling this motor. So there's no fan on the back of it. The blower cooled during your bigger applications or, or heavy vector duty motors where they need to have, uh, because they're running so low down uh, towards zero, they can't cool themselves with, the, with a, their own fan. So you have another motor on the back running a separate fan. And then the most common one out there is the TEFC. Um, that's kind of like the breadwinner for all of them. But it's the most popular one that's out there. Totally enclosed fan cooled. Everybody makes them. Um, everybody's seen them. Now considerations for bearings, um, depending on what your application is and the motor size, because each manufacturer has their own guidelines for when to change to, the, to uh, a roller bearing from a ball bearing. Uh, some manufacturers do it at, do it as low as 50 horse, some say 100 horse. Um, it really depends on the application. Uh, typically, you'll make the switch when you get a heavy overhung load on there, uh, typically belt-driven uh, applications or just a real heavy application like a crusher. You want to try and change over from a ball to a roller. Um, right now, we currently have a situation where it's a 700 horse motor and the manufacturer says, even though it's in line, we still want you to run a ball bearing, which is kind of opposite of what you usually think in a large motor like that. So mechanical materials, um, they're all there to protect the motor uh, from outside sources uh, and to radiate heat off. Uh, so you got rolled steel, which is very common, uh, lower Lower horsepower motors typically are that because um, they're trying to fit a smaller application. And it, the heat source, you know, the heat radiating off of it's a little bit different the way without the fans on it. Stainless steel, uh, that's that can be a fan cooled motor as well. Uh, you know, this one's a TEMV, so it's, it's able to radiate its heat off there. But the stainless steel is really for wash down environment chemicals. Uh, the aluminum, uh, that's becoming a really popular because you want to keep the weight down on the motor. So you can get those into like a smooth extruded body or you can get it where it's like a cast aluminum like in this picture. And then cast iron, it's kind of like the TSC. That's the, that's the one that's always out there. Uh, keeps the motors quiet so they can help meet those guidelines for, for noise levels. And it also convects the heat pretty well. So now we're going to get into the electrical consideration of this. Um, as I stated before, motors are becoming more um, capable of running on a drive. So they're, as it says here, it's, it's starter or slash inverter rated, meaning that it can run on line voltage or it can be run on an inverter per the manufacturer's uh, recommendations. Um, every manufacturer has their own way of doing it, but if they do run a motor on inverter, they have to meet the NEMA MG1 part, fit, uh, part 30. Um, to be able to keep in, in the guidelines. Um, they typically don't run in lower turndown. You, know, you get like 10 to 1, 20 to 1 maybe, because um, they're kind of more used for like a fine tuning of a conveyor. Uh, whereas the vector duty, uh, typically they're, you know, well, vector duty means it can only run on an inverter. Um, they still have to meet the NEMA MG1 part 30. They have much higher turndown ratios. Uh, meaning you can probably, you can run some of them down to a stop and hold it, uh, or you can overspeed them. Uh, so those are the kind of the bigger differences between them. Uh, we also have permanent magnet motors out there. Very small, power dense. Uh, they must be run on an inverter because they, they perform their induction backwards as opposed to a standard uh, induction motor. Um, and they also are very... Uh, efficient, meaning that sometimes the, the power in and power out you're getting, um, it meets or exceeds the, the standards right now, which is IE3 or NEMA premium, or some of them can even meet like ultra premium sizing or IE4. Um, the next motor is an AC laminate motor. These things are, are monsters. They, they just have a ton of power for their size. Uh, typically run on inverter. We've seen a couple that don't need to. Um, 
and they're also uh, premium efficiency or higher. These are on like big, heavy extruder applications, uh, stuff that really requires a lot of low end torque. Cable considerations. Um, <clears throat> They're manufacturer dependent too. Each manufacturer has their lengths that they want you to run at. Um, so, you know, and what type of, type of material it's being used. Uh, it's also often overlooked to the cables when you're when you're replacing it. Sometimes they're oil soaked and you know, probably should be changed out. But um, you know, as it goes for the motors, the manufacturers are really going to have the best the, the last say in what they recommend in that. However, the drive side it also has the recommendations because the motors are very, you know, the drive and the motor kind of have to be tuned together. Um, so the installation guides and considerations like this one right out of the, the Alan Bradley book um, give you the distances you need to be at. If you're slightly over the distance, you, know, you could probably use a voltage um, a device in line to reduce the voltage spikes given off by the drive to help uh, Keep the motor from one overheating and possibly damage in the insulation. So variable speed operations, um, the, you really need to know the horsepower and torque requirements uh, at various speeds uh, it, because you're trying to match the motor to give the best performance for the given job at hand. Uh, desired speed range and load of the motor, again, it's, it's kind of the same as the horsepower and torque. You need to know what you're looking for. Um, to kind of match it with to get the best performance out of the motor. Uh, so the one that circled here that says whether the drive can be configured bypass circuit, that's not going to be used on a vector one. The vector duty motors don't need a bypass because they can't run on it. Um, and then back to mounting and other mechanical considerations. So it kind of it's like an endless loop. You got to kind of look at look at the electrical, you gotta look at the mechanical to make sure you get the right fit. I'll just jump in real quick, Jeff. Um, as a as a reference, a lot of true vector motors can run on bypass, but they're you know the permanent magnet and the laminated. You really have to check with the manufacturer. So there's a, a caveat to that. And then the one little uh, circle up at the top around torque. Um, we've just ran into cases where somebody will want to uh, you know put a drive on an application, and it may have had a 1200 RPM motor across the line. Uh, you ha that's where you have to be conscious of, a, a, you know, lower pole motor, I should say higher pole count motors tend to have more torque or don't tend to, they do have more torque at a given speed than, than the lower. Um, so you just have to be conscious if you're replacing a motor um, with, with an 1800 RPM, you know, that may have been a different pole count before uh, for the torque that your actual application requires. Just like if you overspeed a motor, you can make an 1800 RPM motor if it's a good motor, overspeed with a drive, but then your, your torque starts dropping off at an exponential rate. So um, there's just some things you got to consider when, when putting it into those applications. Back to you, Jeff. Right. So turn down ratio. Every manufacturer has their own chart too. Um, so typically, like I said before, you see 10 to 1, 20 to 1 turn down ratio on the motors that are uh, rated for a cross line or inverter rated. Um, or if you have them where it's a vector duty motor, they're typically much higher, uh, sometimes in the 1,000 to 1 range. So each manufacturer, each motor has its own capability um, depending on what your application is. Uh, so the variable torque. It's just like it says, it, it varies what the torque output is. It's, it's good for fans and blowers and several pumps. Um, anything that's going to have a, have a load that's constantly fluctuating back and forth. Um, constant torque, on the other hand, it's good for conveyors, uh, positive placement pumps, because it's always going to be putting out that constant torque uh, until you get up to the higher RPMs if you're overspeeding, and then it'll start dropping off, as Sean just said. So, again, it's always good to consult with the manufacturer to see what their recommendations are for their turndown ratings um, and then uh, you also need to make sure that if you're using a drive the drive's capable of helping that motor get to what your desired end is 
And uh, <clears throat> just to kind of get and, back to this. And, and Jeff, just to jump in there, there's one thing just it's important to be aware of, just like Jeff showed earlier, the um, – motor lead lengths there's a uh, usually some form of a chart in the vfd manufacturers uh but ultimately between the vfd and the and the motor the motor manufacturer takes precedent um there's also a turndown ratio based on which whoever's drive you're using or which version of drive within a manufacturer you're using just like there's a turn down specific to the motor so again those are a couple of things you just need to match up based on what your application is all right. All right. <clears throat> so, um, kind of pulling this back around with the pictures, um, a lot of times we'll get a picture of a nameplate that's kind of blown out and blurry, kind of can't read it. Um, so when that happens, a lot of times, uh, if if you can get pictures of multiple angles of the motor, a lot of times it can really help us out. Uh, in this instance, you can kind of read the tag, but when you get the picture of the motor, you really can be able to see that, okay, it's an IEC motor. It's got the F0 mount. It's got the D flange or, or the D5. And then uh, it's also got a brake motor on it. So some of that stuff may or may not have been on that tag because I've seen IEC stuff come across that has none of that on there. Um, so you're kind of looking around for it. And if you get a couple of pictures of it, it makes a big difference in, in how fast you can get a turnaround on a, on a quote for you. Or a big one is maybe a motor shop has gotten to the motor and added the brake at a later time or something yeah. different from when the manufacturer actually shipped it and didn't update or reattach a new nameplate. So that is something that if, you know, one of your maintenance people brings in a, a nameplate from a motor and says, here, get me another one of these. That's where the pictures, pictures, pictures comes in because um, you get to see kind of a, a better overall look at the system to make sure that you're replacing it with the right thing. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, here's an example of one that we were looking at. Uh, sometimes the physical need takes precedent over the electrical needs. Uh, in this instance, the motor is a half horsepower, 1800 RPM. Um, I think it was 230, 460 volt, pretty much a common motor right off the shelf. Uh, so what this OEM is having issues with is that it's a tight fit, it's a custom motor, and it's no longer available. So those three things are really, uh, can kind of play havoc on an OEM. So what made this motor custom is if you look, I have it circled here in, in, the, in the view of uh, enlarged so you can see the little nub on the back actually is uh, what's left of uh, a fan that was when this motor was considered a TEFC um, they took the fan and cover off and to get the distance out of it this may have been to uh, provide a way to get the efficiency out of it or to say that it's a custom motor and that it doesn't have to follow the efficiency either or it's no longer made um, so trying to find a replacement motor for it, you really have to look at the available space. So on this one, the available space uh, that we have to go by is from the flange mounting area to the back wall that's behind that motor. Um, and there's not a whole lot of room. Once we found out what the length of the motor was, we could compare it to other motor frame sizes that were available. And there really were only two kind of viable options Unfortunately, the first one wasn't an inventory and it doesn't have an expected lead date till much later down the road. And it's also only a vector duty motor. So if it's an OEM instance, they can't take that motor and put it into a retrofit unless they're changing it over and putting a drive in it. Um, so the next best thing was to scour through manuals and finding out motors that were, were potential candidates. We found one out of five manufacturers. Um, and it looks like it's just fitting there once you pull this motor out, um, knowing that this is a, a standard NEMA size motor, we know that it has a two inch shaft on it. So we we're, we're feel pretty confident that that motor is gonna drop in there with a little bit of wiggling around to get it to fit in there. Uh, so but future consideration for, the, for, the, for an OEM in this instance is either, um, probably easiest to find another motor that's probably another custom in case or when 
the efficiency regulations go up again um, because they're only going to go, they're only keep going forward. They're not going to go backwards. So um, to try and keep a motor in there, they're really, you know, in the future, probably going to have to look towards another uh, custom motor to make it work. So those are some of the things that we deal with. I see on a daily basis. Sometimes like this, a picture is worth uh, a lot more than just kind of a description in an email. So with that, I think that's the end. Um, yeah. If you have any questions or you, you have a, a an application you might want us to take a look at, just, uh, here's my contact information. You can shoot me a message or a question, and I'll see if I can answer it for you. All right. Thanks, Jeff. And uh, and with that, I mean, a couple of caveats. We we didn't cover every aspect or every detail that you will run into. Uh, there's still a, a, a lot of things that could be could be talked about, but but mainly, you know, what Jeff just covered are the things that are fairly regular. Some, you know, things that come up uh, on a daily basis or multiple times a day uh, that we see. I mean, there are ultimately, you know, details of when you get into to brakes or you get into stub shafts on the back of motors for feedback devices and tax and encoders and some other things that obviously get very much more specific to an application. Um, but, but the general ones that, that Jeff covered here are, are the things that kind of hit us on, you know, all the time. Well, with that, um, I do, or I would from Rumsey's perspective, thank everyone for tuning in. Uh, Jeff Llewellyn's information is up there, so if, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us, especially if you have specific ones or just some guidance that you're looking for. We'd be more than happy to, uh, to talk to you. Uh, don't forget that we'll be putting these Locked In series on every Tuesday and Thursday through the end of May. Thank you very much.